I'm super excited to be here for a couple of reasons. One is this. I really believe, and I think some of you are with me on this, I really believe that you are in a special moment in the life of this church. There's some beautiful stuff going on with the partnership between First Baptist and uh, Church by the Glades and the new energy and vitality and vision. I mean, this is a really, really special moment. And I want you to know that pastors from across Broward County are cheering you on. They're praying for you. They're excited about what God is doing here. Uh, because it's a really special thing. And I would say, for me, not just what's happening here on Sunday mornings. I mean, this is really special. But you know one of the things that excites me is when I see what's happening on Fridays at rallies. Anybody excited about that? Like, as a pastor, when you think hundreds of young people showing up on a Friday night in downtown Fort Lauderdale to learn about Jesus and worship. Guys, that is a move of God. That is a special thing. So it's a really, really beautiful season that you're in. An honor to be a, a quick part of it. Uh, but the other reason I, I was excited to be here is because of who your pastor is, Pastor David. Uh, one of the things for me that I really respect about Pastor David is not just his capacity and giftedness on stage. Of course, he has that. But really for me, what really I really respect is what happens off stage. Off stage, Pastor David is one of the kindest, most gracious, most cheer you on pastors that I've ever met. And you guys are really blessed to have him and, and Lisa. They've been such a blessing to Melissa and I. And uh, so when he invited me to come speak, I was like, yes, I'm so excited uh, to be with you this morning. But today, I want to talk about something that nobody in the room deals with. None of you in the room deal with this, and that is worry. I want to talk about worry. The thing about worry is that worry has been around from Genesis 3 at least, right? When, when sin entered the world at the fall, humanity has wrestled with the reality of worry. But I think in 2024, we live in a cultural and technological moment that is like finely tuned to accelerate your experience of worry. I'll give you a couple examples of that. I have, a, I have an Apple watch. Do we have any Apple Mac people here in the room this morning? Any of you? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, we're praying for you Android users. All right, just like ditch the green bubble, all right? Come on over to the dark side. Well, the other day, I, I, was, I, was, I got a little notification on my watch, and I looked down, and it said, your cardio fitness levels have been lower for the last two weeks. I looked at that, and I thought to myself a couple of things. One is like, I don't remember asking my watch to update me on my cardio fitness levels. Number, number two, I'm like, I don't even know what cardio fitness level means. Like, what does that mean? So immediately, I'm filled with, what do you think, worry. And so I go on Google. That's what you do when you're worried, right? And I start Googling, what does cardio fitness level mean in an Apple Watch? How low is too low? How long before I die? Like, those are the questions I'm asking. Like, just this, fine, this moment we're in, finely tuned to accelerate our experience of worry. I'll give you one more example of that. Um, we live in what is called a 20, an experience, what, what's called a 24-hour news cycle which means there is always new news to be read and to be had and bombarding us with all this information. And one of the things you've probably noticed, when you go to a news website or whatever news app you use, all of the time, every time, the top stories are never stories that are good. Have you ever noticed that? But you'll never go online, whatever your news website is, and see 15-year-old boy helps elderly woman across the street in downtown Fort Lauderdale. That'll never make it to the top. What makes it to the top? The stuff that cultivates fear and anxiety and worry. It's like, are we headed to World War III? That'll make it to the top. Is bird flu the next global pandemic? That'll make it to the top. And this is the moment that we live in. And because we just naturally wrestle with worry, relational worry and financial worry and health issues and job issues and all of that, and we live in this cultural and technological moment that accelerates our experience of worry, all, oftentimes what you see in 2024 is people whose lives are racked and ruled by worry and anxiety. And the question I want to ask you this morning is what are you going to do about that? What are we going to do about that? Because I really think there are only two options. Option number one is we just go with the flow, and we give in, and we go, you know what, Pastor John, here's the deal. Worry is the standard operating procedure of almost everybody in South Florida in 2024. It's just our lot in life. It's just the way things are. That's one way to handle it, but I think there's a better way. I believe that God did not design you to be ruled by worry, and I believe that you don't want to be ruled by worry, and God doesn't want you to be ruled by worry. So this morning, I want to invite you into the way of Jesus. 
But I believe that Jesus is calling us into a new kind of way in which we operate and handle the difficulties in our life. Well, today we'll be looking at a portion of Scripture from Matthew chapter 6. It's a part of what's called the Sermon on the Mount. For all the theologians in the room, you know that the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' greatest teaching ever. And in the Sermon on the Mount, he outlines sort of the ethical implications of following Jesus, meaning this is what it looks like if you're going to actually follow Jesus. And in one of the sections on the Sermon on the Mount, he has a section on worry. And that's what we're going to explore today and process through what Jesus has to say. And and, and here's what I want you to hear. This is the goal of this message. In the text that we're going to study this morning, Jesus is going to teach you and teach me how to learn to let go of worry. We'll take a look in Matthew chapter 6. Starts like this in verse 25. Therefore, this is Jesus speaking, I tell you, what are those next three words? Read them out loud with me. Do not worry. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to turn to someone next to you, point at them and say, do not worry. All right, go ahead and do it. Do not worry. Now I want you to go to the person on the other side you ignored the first time and say, do not worry. Tell them to. Do not worry. Therefore, I tell you, Jesus says, do not worry about your life, what you eat or drink, about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? One of the things I love about Jesus is his directness. So he begins this section in the Sermon on the Mount on worry, and he gets right to the point. And he sort of squares his shoulder up to us, and he looks at us, and he says, here's the deal. If you're going to follow me, this is the way of Jesus. Do not worry. Now, if you think about it, that, this could, as we read this text, this could be the shortest sermon in the history of First Baptist Fort Lauderdale right here. Because if you know anything about following Jesus, you know that Jesus isn't just our Savior, he's also our Lord, which means that when Jesus speaks, we listen and we follow. So it seems like it could be as simple as this. I stand up here this morning, I read the words of Jesus to all of you here, do not worry, I turn off the iPad, I give you a blessing, you go out never to worry again. Except for this one tricky problem, it is not that easy. And it's not that easy because even those of us in this room who call ourselves followers of Jesus, Christians, many of us are more deeply entangled with worry than we would care to admit. I I want to sort of plot on a continuum for you this morning, some different ways that we engage with worry. And I'd love for you to process with me as I give you these different plots in the continuum, I want you to process with me maybe where you find yourself on this continuum. Okay, I'll start over here. And over here is someone who never worries at all. And if you happen to be one of those people in the room, praise God, okay? Teach us after. I mean, that's you, okay? Never worries at all. Now I'll go a little bit further on the continuum, and this is what I'll call a sporadic Worrier. Can you say that out loud with me? A sporadic worrier. A sporadic worrier. Is, you're somebody, it's like you're not, your life isn't ruled by worry, but there are certain things that trigger you. For some of you, it's finances, perhaps it's health, perhaps it's relationship issues. And when those things trigger you, boom, you go in that worry cycle that it's hard to get out of. So we've got no worrying at all. We've got sporadic worrier. We'll move a little bit further on the continuum. And now we have what I'll call a consistent worrier. A consistent worrier is somebody who's not always worrying. That may be you. You're not always worrying, but it's there more often than you'd like. That sort of feeling in the pit of your stomach of fear of the future of whatever's coming is there more often. And you'd wish it were not so, but it's pretty consistent. And then all the way over here on the other side of the spectrum, I'd call it a chronic worrier. Can you say that out loud with me? A chronic worrier. A chronic worrier, and this might be you, is somebody who is always worrying. Worry and anxiety has to you become like a low-grade fever that you can't get rid of. It's always there. No matter where you're at, you feel it. You're at your kid's baseball game. You're supposed to be enjoying that, but man, that chronic worry is just right under the surface. You showed up to church this morning. There's beautiful music playing and declaring the goodness and the greatness of God, and you're supposed to be worshiping. But under the surface, it's this, all of these question marks and fears and worry and anxiety about the fu- future. It's a chronic worrier. You're a chronic worrier if you're somebody who's been worrying so much that you can't even remember what peace feels like anymore. Wherever you find yourself on the spectrum, I have good news for you. And the good news is that Jesus understands our weakness. 
And the good news is that Jesus in his wisdom in this particular text doesn't just say, do not worry, period, end of story. He doesn't just look at you and say, stop it, stop worrying, stop. That's not what he does. He says, do not worry. And then in the rest of the text, he unpacks for us. He gives us some handles that all of us in our frailty and our struggles can hold on to so that we can learn to let go of worry. And what we're going to look at this morning are two shifts in the way we think. Shift number one is going to be a shift in the way you think about worry as it is. Just the way you see worry is a shift that Jesus wants you to make. And then the second shift we're going to make is a shift in the way we think about God and our relationship with God. And I'm convinced, as what Jesus is laying out here, if we can make these two shifts in our mind of how we think about worry and how we think about God, that it'll free us in some beautiful ways to learn to let go of worry. So here it is, shift number one. If you're a note taker, write this down, and it is this. You have to come to terms with the benefits of worry. You have to come to terms with the benefits of worry. Here's what I mean. If if you're going to learn to let go of worry, then you have to get to a place where you understand what benefits you're getting from it, so that you can let go of it. Take a look at what Jesus says in verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. We'll get to that text in a minute. Are you not much more valuable than they? Now pay attention to verse 27, and it's underlined on the screen, so I'd love for you to read this aloud with me. This is Jesus' question. Let's read. Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? I love that question. In that question, Jesus is trying to calibrate in your mind, help you to come to terms with the benefits of worry. Now, what I'd love to do with that question is I want to pluck it out of first century Israel, and I want to take it to 2024 Fort Lauderdale. And I want you to imagine that you were able to book a coffee meeting one-on-one with Jesus. Now, for the theological people in the room, I recognize that's not possible. Okay, just hang with me. But just go with me. Imagine that you can do that. And you're going to talk to him about this text. And so you go over to Wells Coffee down the street. You order your pour over. He's got his latte. You sit down at the table. As soon as you sit down, you're ready for it. And you sit down and you look at Jesus and say, Jesus, I just don't get it. I don't understand. I heard what you said in the Sermon on the Mount. Do not worry. Jesus, have you seen my life? Seems very unreasonable for you to tell me not to worry. Jesus, I have so many things that I can be worried about. I can be worried about my finances. There's problems there. I could be worried about my health, Jesus. There are problems there. I could be worried about my relationships, Jesus. I got problems there. Jesus, have you met my children? I could really be worried about them. And you look at Jesus and you're like, so I don't understand. These things are keeping me up at night. I have so many valid reasons to worry. How can you say to me, do not worry? Then I want you to imagine that Jesus hears you. He kind of leans over the table at Wells Coffee, and he looks you in the eye and says, I hear you. What you're going through is difficult, but may I ask you a question? Then he looks you straight in the eye and says this, all of the worrying you've been doing the last week, last month, last year, last 10 years, all of that cumulative worrying, let me ask you this question. Can all of that worry add one single hour to your life? I want you to imagine that Jesus asks you that question, and he intends for you to answer yes or no. And so on the count of three, I want you to answer. Jesus looked at you and said, all of your worry, all the stuff you've been worrying about for the last 10, 15 years, can it add a single hour to your life? Yes or no? On the count of three, I want you to give me the answer. One, two, three, no. It doesn't. Why? Here's Jesus said, I said that Jesus wants you to come to terms with the benefits of worry. You know what the benefits of worry are? There are none. That's his point. His point is, there are no benefits to worry. It doesn't add a single hour to your life. As a matter of fact, research would show that if you worry enough and are anxious enough, it'll take hours from your life because it's actually bad for your physical health. Worry doesn't benefit you at all. Think about this with me. Worry doesn't benefit you. It doesn't add any hours to your life. But even more than that, think about your own mental health. After you've been done worrying for like a 45-minute worry session, struggling, questioning, all this kind of stuff, when you're done with 45 minutes of worry, let me ask you a question. How do you feel after that? 
Do you feel rejuvenated? Do you feel at peace? Do you feel ready to conquer the day? Do you feel, man, I want to spend some time with my family now. How do you feel? You feel drained. Why? Because worry doesn't help your mental health. It hurts it. How about money? Have you ever had a situation where you get a bill in the mail you weren't expecting or an email that you weren't expecting, and you and your wife for two days straight are just pulling your hair out, worried, how are we going to pay for this? We don't have the money. What's going to happen? Let me ask you this question. After all of that time of worrying, does the bill go away? Does money fall from heaven to pay for it? No, like worrying doesn't pay the bills. Look, let me give you one more. How about this? Does anybody here ever, when you have a really difficult conversation come up and it's like a week away, does anyone ever feel worried and anxious about that? Some of you in this room, man, you've got a difficult conversation and for the entire week, you're playing that conversation over and over in your head and, and like worried, worried, worried about the response. At the end of that week after worrying, does your worrying change the person's response to that difficult conversation? No, it doesn't. Does it change the outcome? No, it doesn't. Here's Jesus' point. Jesus' point is, if you are going to let go of worry, then you have to shift your thinking about worry, and you have to come to terms with the benefits. There are none. Because here's the reality about worry. Worry doesn't give. Worry only takes. Can we say that out loud together? Let's do it. Ready? Let's read it together. Worry doesn't give. Worry only takes. Now, here's the deal. Generally speaking, if you're in a relationship with someone who never gives and only takes, you know what we call that? We call that a dysfunctional relationship. And some of you in this room are in a dysfunctional relationship with worry. Think about it like this. I want you to imagine that you have a condo here in downtown. You have an extra room in your condo. And you decide that you want to rent out the room. For the going rate of a room in downtown Fort Lauderdale, something like $4,000 a month. Isn't it like that around here? It's a little pricey down this way. So you decide to rent out that room and you go through some friends. Like you find a friend of a friend and you tell this person, listen, don't worry about first and last. Just pay the $4,000 a month. You got a place to live. Great. First day, everything seems like it's going wonderful. The next day you go to work and you come back home. And when you get back home, the TV that was on the wall is no longer on the wall. You look at your roommate like, yo, what happened to that TV? And he's like, bro, I'm so sorry. I have to pay my uncle back for some money that he loaned me. And so I took your TV and I took it to a pawn shop to get some money. I promise I'll pay you back. Okay, now you're really generous. So you go, no worries, just pay, pay me back. Next day you go to, go to work, you come back home. There are, there's no furniture in your living room at all. Sofa's gone, couch is gone, lazy boy that you love gone. You look at your roommate like you're bro. What you do with my, my furniture? And he's like, Facebook Marketplace, you know, I got a good, good amount of money for it. I had to pay my cousin back for some, but don't you worry, I'll pay you back. Okay, next morning you wake up to go to work. You normally have your laptop on the kitchen counter. Your laptop's not there, you're getting the picture now. Who took it? Your roommate. So imagine he takes, 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 and then it gets to the end of the month when he's supposed to pay you for, for like the amount that he owes you and he doesn't have it. And the next month he doesn't have it and he doesn't clean up and he doesn't help out. He doesn't give. He only takes. Let me ask you a question. At the end of the day, what are you going to do with that roommate? Evict You're going to evict him. Thank you very much. Here's the problem. The problem is that some of you have been roommates with worry for like 20 years and you haven't evicted it yet. You keep making excuses for worry. You keep, well, there's a reason why I'm holding on. There's a reason why I'm allowing this in my life. There's a reason why I'm not letting, letting go. You keep extending the lease of worry in your life. And Jesus is like, guys, before you can ever let go of worry, you have to shift your thinking and begin to understand this thing that I'm allowing to be in my life, that I'm allowing to be in my, in my, my house is not benefiting me. Worry doesn't give. Worry only takes. That's shift to number one. Here's the, here's the second shift that Jesus wants to make. The first shift, I think, is, is sort of a pragmatic thing. The second shift that Jesus wants you to make is a theological shift. I actually think this is the more important shift, but they both work together. And the second shift is this. You need to know who you are to God. Can we say that out loud together? Know who you are to God. Listen to what Jesus says in the text that we've been looking at. He says, look at the birds of the air. So Jesus is going to help you shift your thinking about God. And it starts in a little bit of a strange way by talking about birds. Okay? But, but follow Jesus. He says, hey guys, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow 
or reap or store away in barns. Now pause. Jesus is saying, listen, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but birds don't plant seeds and birds don't reap harvests and birds don't have barns that they fill up. In other words, Jesus is like, birds are not farmers, right? They don't drive John Deere tractors. <laughs> they don't wear overalls. They don't have these, you know, amazing systems of food. They don't do any of that. So Jesus says, you see that, right? You, you recognize that. And then he says this, and yet somebody feeds them. Who's the one that feeds the birds? What's he say? Who you are? Your heavenly father. Your heavenly father feeds them. Okay, so this is what Jesus is doing. He's trying to get you to see something about you by first going to the birds. Now, think about this with me. What Jesus is saying is about God's power, God's care, and God's wisdom and oversight of the birds. And he's like, all of these birds are taken care of, God, of by God. They're not alone. They're not by themselves. They've got someone in their corner, namely God. Now, I was uh, working with a young guy in our church to preach his first sermon at our youth ministry. His name's Elijah, and he was going through this text. And as he was studying this text, he came to me and said, Pastor John, I, I found something I thought was pretty cool. And I said, yeah, what? And he said, he said, do you know how many birds there are on the planet? I'll ask that to you. Do you know how many birds there are on the planet? The number he came up with is, some, some, by some estimates, there are 50 billion birds on the planet. With a B, 50 billion. That's a lot of birds. And Elijah's like, they're 50 billion. So what Jesus is saying is it's not just that, oh, God cares for that little sparrow and that little blue jay. He's like, God cares for 50 billion birds every single day. I mean, think about the power. This is what Jesus is trying to get you to see. He's like, I want you to think about the power and the scope and the capacity of God the Father, right? That every single morning, all 50 billion are fed until their time on earth is up. And God sees them, God knows their story, God understands them, and he cares for them. I want you to think about this. God knows the birthplace of every blue jay. God knows the flight path of every bald eagle. God knows the plate that every turkey is going to end up on on Thanksgiving dinner. Like, God knows every single thing. He's, he's that involved. He's that in control. And he cares that much. And so Jesus's point is like, if this is what God does for them, how about much more for you? Look again, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. And then he asks this question that I need you first Baptist to read out loud with me with some strength. Here's the question. Let's read. Are you not much more valuable than they? You see what Jesus is saying? He's like, guys, if the Father knows all of those details about a bird, and he feeds the birds, and he cares about the birds, don't you realize you're way, 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 way more valuable than them? Let me ask you this question. Why are you so much more valuable than them? Well, why, why, are, why are birds valuable to God? They're valuable because they are his creation. God cares about his creation. Like we should care for his creation because it's God's creation. It, it reflects the glory of God, right? So we care about, he cares about them because they're a part of his creation. Why are you and I, when you're in Jesus Christ, more valuable to God than the birds? Here's why. Because we are not just God's creation. We are God's children. Now you gotta hear this. This, this, is, this is important. This is a fundamental difference. And when you really understand it, it changes things. You are not just God's creation. God is not just some distant deity who created the world, kind of spun it all up and sits back and does nothing. No, you, if you're in Christ Jesus, are a child of God. One of the most beautiful metaphors that the Bible gives us about salvation. What is salvation? Some of you here are Christians. Some of you are not yet. You haven't crossed the line of faith. So let me just explain it. Here's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. You acknowledge your sin before God. Oh man, I've messed up. I've not always honored you, God. And you believe that Jesus Christ lived, died, and rose again for you. And then you confess with your mouth, Jesus, you're my Lord. I'm going to follow you. And when that happens, something shifts. A supernatural event takes place and you become born again. And when you are born again, the Bible says that you're not just born again, you are adopted into the family of God. And you are now his child, and he is now your father. And when God becomes your father, it changes the game. Because now you don't just have a God who's out there, you have a God who's for you. You have a God who will provide for you. You have a God who sees you. You have a God who loves you, and he knows you. 
Because here's the deal. Like, like here's the deal. I would listen, listen through what Jesus says in this particular text. This is all about the fatherhood of God. He says, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? This is the end of the text. Or what shall we wear? For the pagans, so the pagans are those who don't have God as their father. For the pagans run after all these things. And then he says this, and what are those next three words? Your heavenly father knows that you need them. When you walked in the room this morning, please understand God knows everything and knew everything that you needed. As you sit here this morning, God knows everything that you need. He knows the finances you need. He knows the healing that you need. He knows the strength you need. He knows what you need. And Jesus says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has trouble of its own. Jesus is saying, when you understand that God is your father, it changes the game. And one of the reasons why it changes the game and one of the reasons why Jesus can so audaciously look you in the eye in the midst of the complexity of your life and say, do not worry is because he knows this about God being your father. And he knows this, he knows that provision is part of the parental relationship. Like this is part and parcel of what it means for him to be your father is that he will provide. Now, as I say that, I recognize that not everybody in this room grew up with a father who provided for you. Some of you didn't have a father in your life. Some of you had an absent father. Some of you had a harsh father, abusive father. I want you to know something, First Baptist, that no matter what type of earthly father you had, when you were in Jesus, you have a heavenly father that loves you and cares for you and will provide for you. Provision is part of the parental relationship. At the beginning of every school year, we have this little tradition where we take our boys, we have two sons, we take our boys to celebrate the beginning of the school year to the best ice cream shop in South Florida. Does anyone want to venture a guess where it is? Jackson's. We got a good crowd here this morning. And if you're new to South Florida, you got to stop by Jackson's. It's been around for like a hundred years or something like that. It's its own institution unto itself. We go to Jackson's ice cream and, and here's what happens. We get to ice Jackson's. They order what they want for dinner. They order what they want for, for dessert. And then the waitress comes with the check. And when she walks over the check, I take the check from her and I slide it to my 11 year old and say, you're paying this time. No, that's not what I do. I slide it to my 14 year old and say, be a man. No, that's not what I do. Here's what I do. When the waitress comes with the check, I lift up my hand and I take care of it and I provide for them because provision is part of the parental relationship. This is my role. Like I'm going to, I brought them here. I'm going to bring them through it, right? I'm providing for them. Now, I want you to imagine that you're doing that celebration. Beginning of the year, you're with your kids. If you have children or if you don't, just imagine the situation. You go to Jackson's. Imagine you have two kids with you and you ask your first son, you say, son, so glad we're here. What do you want for dinner? He said, man, I really, dad, I really want the hot dog. But I looked at the, it's $15.70, dad. I don't know if I'm going to be able to pay for it. And then you say, you don't have to worry, bud. I got it. I'm going to take care of it. And then he looks at you and goes, I don't know if you can pay for it. And he looks at your other son and you're like, hey, what do you want? He said, man, I really want the banana split. And you're like, well, get it. He's like, yeah, but boy, that banana split's 17 bucks. And I don't know if I can pay for it. And then you say the same thing, but I'm here. I'll take care of it. And he looks at you and says, I don't know if you can pay for it. And then imagine you're there. It's supposed to be a celebration for an hour and a half at Jackson's Ice Cream. And both of your sons are wringing their hands in worried. Oh my gosh, I don't know what's going to happen. We're never going to be able to pay for this meal. And they don't enjoy it one bit. Parents, let me ask you this question. How would you feel? You feel grieved. You feel grieved. You'd look at them and say, guys, don't you realize if I brought you here, I'm going to bring you through? Don't you realize if I brought you here, I will provide for you? Don't you realize that I'm your father? Don't you realize I have a plan? Don't you realize I'm wise enough and capable enough to take care of this? And so what I want you to do is let go and enjoy. And there's some of you in the room this morning that it's like you've been sitting at the table at Jackson's Ice Cream with your heavenly father in your life. And for the last five years or 10 years or six months, you've been wringing your hands. God, I don't know how I'm going to do it. And God, I don't know how you're going to do it. And God's looking at you say, I need you to trust me. Because when you begin to have that shift, 
that God is your father and provision is part of the parental relationship, it changes the game. Jesus does not want you to live a life ruled and wrecked by worry and anxiety. Jesus wants you to experience the freedom of what it means to follow him. And so he needs you to make that shift where you begin to come to terms with the benefits of worry that there are none. Worry doesn't give, worry only takes. He needs you to make that shift where you begin to understand who you are to God, that you are his child, not just his creation. I want to close this morning with just a personal story, if I could, of a moment where I was kind of wrestling with this. I want to take you back to 2020. Some of you are like, I want to go back there, John. In the middle of the global pandemic, it was the fall of that year. And, um, and as a pastor, if you talk to any pastor, 2020 was like the worst year of pastoring ever. For one thing, for us, we'd been online, and then when churches started to open up, we meet in portable spaces. The space that we normally meet in on Sunday mornings wasn't available for a while, and so we had to meet on Sunday nights only. That was all we could do. So I'm asking questions like, man, is this church even going to make it through the pandemic? This is tough. Not only that, right, we were in the midst of political divisions and racial tension and then personally health issues, and we had some really close people that we deeply loved that we lost during that year, I mean, it just felt like a pressure cooker. And we were the fall of that year in North Carolina at a friend's cabin. I was sitting out on the porch of the cabin. And while I was out there, I just felt like, you know what I said earlier about chronic warriors where it's like you can't even remember what peace feels like? Can I just be really honest? That's what I felt like in that moment, which is a really strange place for you as a pastor. You're like, I'm supposed to preach about this, not deal with this. And I felt like there was this blanket of worry and anxiety and fear on me. And so I, I used to be a worship leader, so I got up my guitar and I started trying to write a song to kind of process through this. That didn't work. And so I ended up writing a poem about the moment. And in just a moment, I want to share the poem with you, if I could. The poem has got two parts, okay? The first part was me sort of articulating like what worry had done to me and, and what it had sort of stolen from me and how I allowed it into my life. And then the second part of the poem was almost like this declaration of independence from worry where I was like, I can't keep living like this. I have to trust the Lord in this. And so I wrote this poem and it was like a prayer to the Lord. And at the end of that, for writing, and I don't know if you've ever had an experience like this, I just sensed like God met me in such a profound way with his presence. It was almost like at the end of this, it's like he lifted off of me the weight that I'd been holding and I could exhale again and I could breathe again and I could have strength again. And so I'd love to read this for you. Just quick disclaimer, I'm not trying to pretend like I'm some poet or anything like that. I just want you to hear this as just the heart of a fellow journeyer processing through what it looks like to learn to let go of worry and follow the way of Jesus. The poem's called Worry Away With You. It goes like this, worry, you thief. You pick the lock of my mind and creep in when I least expect. My peace, your prize. You seek to abscond with that which is my heavenly birthright and leave in its place a jittery uneasiness, a queasy quasi panic unbefitting a child of the king. Worry, you liar. With your forked tongue, you hiss in my ear. Manna today doesn't mean manna tomorrow. God cannot be trusted. This wilderness wandering will not lead to the promised land. Your words are as conniving as they are convincing, and often I believe you. Worry, you kidnapper, so skilled at stealing me from the present. You turn my attention instead to dreadful hypotheticals, worst case scenarios that may never come to pass. With them, you capture my gaze just long enough to distract me from the simple good gifts of God in the moment. But things will not continue like this. You've taken enough from me. Worry, I will no longer allow you to sneak into my mind and steal from me with impunity. For my savior is Jesus, the Prince of Peace, and he will restore what you've stolen and grant me his peace that passes understanding. Worry. I rebuke the lie you whisper so confidently that God will not provide. My father's very name is Jehovah Jireh, and I'm certain that he who redeemed me through parted waters will provide manna when I am in need. Worry, 
I fling wide the door of your pitiful prison within which you have kidnapped my attention. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit through whose power I am free. He is renewing my mind to see and to savor the good God is working out for me in every breath I breathe. Worry away with you. Jesus has emancipated me from your tyrannical rule and I choose to walk today in the path of the Prince of Peace. Amen. I want to close by praying for you because I believe that just as the Holy Spirit met me on that porch in 2020 as I wrote these words and I said, Jesus, I want to follow you. I believe that the Holy Spirit can meet you here this morning. And so here's what I'd love to do. If you would close your eyes and if you're in the room this morning and as I'm talking about worry, you're like, John, would you pray for me? I want you to pray that God would free me and give me strength to overcome this worry. If that's you, just slip up your hand all across this room and I want to pray this prayer over you of freedom and the blessing of God. Father, right now with hands lifted, We acknowledge our frailty. We acknowledge the fact that sometimes, even as followers of Jesus, we struggle more than we'd like to admit with this. But God, with hands raised, we come before you believing that you are the God who cares meticulously about the details of our life. You care about the financial issues. You care about the health issues. You care about the relationship problems. God, we believe that you care and that you love us. And so right now what I'm asking for my fellow brothers and sisters in this room is that you would give them freedom, that you would lift off the burden from their chest, that you would, God, give them the sense of your presence, that you are with them, that you love them, and that you know them. Would you do this? Would you allow us to walk in your freedom, we ask, in the beautiful name of Jesus. And everyone together said, Amen, amen.